Thanks very much, Mike. So I've sort of um, put this presentation together a bit, um, as Mike said, around um, around the quality. So I'm not sure how many of you guys are familiar, girls are familiar with the, um, the Silver Plume Farm BPQ program, but it's a it's a program that um, pays a significant premium, I guess, for uh, for marbling. So marbling is something that. Um, we've been chasing for quite some time and um, it's probably the first program or it is the first program in New Zealand that's um, paying a premium for it. So the, the, the reason um, I've got this focus on the, on the BPQ program is that it's actually very hard to achieve um, the master grade for BPQ but um, we'll, we'll get on to that afterwards. But, um, so um, our breeding objectives at Mount Linton are um, we want to breed an animal that lowers the cost of production. So it's, um, it's, it's very easy these days just by selecting breeding values to get as much growth as you can into animals just by selecting uh, for four and six hundred day. But the challenge is really is um, to lower the cost of production and the way we do that is to try and have a a limit on your mature cow size. You don't want to be feeding cows that are seven, eight hundred kilos when you can have a cow that's doing 500, a 550 kilo cow doing exactly the same job. And that's all about material efficiency and fertility. So we've always had a very strong focus on fertility in our herd and um, regularly achieving sort of 95% calving. Dice to calving is a very important um, BBB for, uh, in the fertility. So um, the sooner that cow, that cow drops a calf on the ground, it's got longer time to get back in calf, so it's very important. It's probably the most important um, trait that uh, has the biggest effect on fertility. Um, the role of fat and EMA. So in our environment, as you can see, we need cows that are able to lay down fat very easily in the, when there's a surplus of feed in the spring and then they use that fat to get back in calf in a, in a tight spring and they can also, um, we can lose about 150 kilos over the winter. So those animals need that fat to be able to survive the winters because they get no supplementary feeding at all. On the other hand, there's a negative correlation between fat and eye muscle area. So you need to be very conscious that you don't start not breeding cattle that are just big balls of lard really, so you need to make sure that you keep the EMA up, the eye muscle area. I've talked about the mature pattern before, and um, I've got a very strong focus on that. As I said, you need to be able to um, have an animal that's going to be easy to winter, and um, an animal that's got a high mature pattern is going to be very difficult to winter without any supplement. We talked about growth and muscling, so we want animals that grow as fast as they possibly can to two year old and then stop growing. And we need animals that are full of meat. And I've always been a believer that um, you don't need frame to get weight into your animals. If you've got a, a, a muscly animal, it can be, be a smaller frame and, um, and still grow. There's a couple of um, BPQ, um, sheets here, one on the left hand side is um, earlier on in the, in the season. So the red is the animals that achieved the uh, BPQ and the green ones are the ones that, sorry, the green ones are the ones that made it and the red ones are the ones that fell out of the BPQ. So there's about, there's 21 in so it's 21 out of 19 in, so it's just under sort of 50%. Um, um, these animals were killed in um, in June, which was before we start transitioning them onto fodder beef. This one here is um, is later on in July, and you can see the effect of the fodder beef on the marbling. So this line here is our result and the little arrow here is the national or 
is the average of the rest of the animals in our, on, on, the, on the BPQ. So obviously the higher the better for marbling. You want as much rib fat as you can because it helps set the carcass. Meat color is very important because um, if it's too high, obviously um, has a big bearing on, on, the, um, on the eating quality. So you want, um, you want the pinker meat and um, fat color also very important because the consumer doesn't want yellow fat. Um, um, the fodder beet also has a, has a big effect on the fat color. pH level is, um, goes hand in hand with meat color. So if you've got a high pH level, you want it as low as you possibly can. That's the glycogen in the muscles. Um, so there's a lot of um, management involved in getting those pH levels down. You can see they're quite a bit lower here than they are in, in the earlier kill. So this is off grass and this is off fodder beet. Ossification is, um, is the process from, from which the, um, the cartilage in the backbone turns to, to, um, to, to bone and um, it has a, um, a, a big effect on, um, estrogen has a big effect on it so it's much harder to get heifers to um, keep the ossification down than steers because the onset of puberty and estrogen brings on the ossification process. So we've also got a one spread heifer system at Mount Linton where we take a calf out of them and then we kill them and it's very hard to achieve a master grade on those heifers because of the level of ossification. So what are the economics of BPQ? premium is uh, 25 cents, so on a 300 kg carcass weight animal, which is what our target is, it's $75 a head. Um, the national average hit rate for BPQ is about 29%. We achieved, sorry, we achieved a 70% um, hit rate over 1,350 animals last year, so we're more than double the average. And the premiums we achieved last year from the BPQ meeting the reserve grade was $68,000, which isn't a fortune, but it's, um, it, it's um, significant. And we've already discussed the, the six criteria that make up the reserve grade. So um, where do we source our genetics from? Um, we mainly source our genetics from Australia, and the reason for that is the there aren't really any herds in New Zealand or very few animals in New Zealand that um, can do for us what we need to on the, on the marbling. The, re Sorry. the reason we go to Australia is because in the 1990s the Australians got access to the Japanese market so all of a sudden they had a huge focus on carcass and particularly on marbling because that market in Japan was totally focused on marbling. So the Australians are, are years and years ahead of us on, in terms of carcass genetics. We've sort of aligned ourselves with a stud in Australia called Rennie Lee, who've got a very strong focus on, on carcass data and also have very similar breeding objectives to us. So they only mate for 35 days and have got a strong focus on keeping the mature pattern down. And it takes time. We're finding that we've been using these high marbling sires for years and um, it's not until those females start, start coming through your herd that you start getting the consistent results on the, um, on the BPQ and the marbling. These steers are yearling steers and they're on red clover. We've got 200 hectares of red clover. Put a bolus in them in the spring, a uh, blood capsule, and they did 2.25 uh, kilos a day for the first 100 days, oh, sorry, for the first 60 days and they did 1.75 for the rest. So um, they put on about 180 kilos over that 100 days for an investment of $17 in the bowlers. Makes good sense. Um, these are the sort of genetics that we're looking for and, and um, this genetic package is um, almost perfect for what we're looking for. So this bull here is strongly positive for daughters and direct calving ease. He's got a low gestation length, which is desirable. He's got a low birth weight. He's got 
very good grow and then he drops off from mature cow weight. So his mature cow weight is lower than his 600 day weight. And one of my philosophies is I want the 400 day weight to be about the same as the mature cow weight. We want these animals to grow as fast as they possibly can until they're about 18 months, two year old, which is when we're killing them and then we want them to stop. <coughs> Milk is quite important for us. Um, we, want, we don't want too much, but um, we want sappy calves of weaning. Scrotal size, obviously, the relationship between scrotal size and daughter's um, fertility is quite well known. Minus nine for days to calving, he's, one, he's a trait leader for that, which is also, as I've mentioned previously, the, um, probably the most important one in, in, uh, in the fertility side of things. He's got a very good carcass weight. He's got a high eye muscle area. I think breed average is 4.4, so he's not quite double breed average. And um, he's fat as well, which is what we need. And obviously, marbling, he's um, two and a half times breed average for marbling. I use the Angus Pure Index a lot, and uh, this guy here is double breed average for Angus Pure. So what are the EBVs that we need to target to um, to hit the BPQ master grade? Well, the most important one is marbling. 60% of the animals that fall out of um, the BPQ are because they're not well marbled enough. Obviously, we want as much growth as we possibly can. We want rib and rump fat for the reasons I explained earlier, for the maternal reasons as well as having the carcasses finished. Eye muscle area, of course, very important, and it has a negative correlation between rib and rump, and again, the early maturity pattern. So, um, these guys are on Fodabig. We <coughs> started off about three years ago as a bit of an experiment with about 25 hectares of Fodabig. Then we grew 60 hectares last year, and we've grown 85 hectares this year killing about 40% of our animals before they go into the winter, before they go on to Fodabig, and start the transition about the middle of May. We're very particular about the transition period, so we follow the rules very carefully. And then once they've transitioned, we just fully feed them um, on Fodabig and reduce the fibre right back, so they're barely getting a kilo of dry matter in terms of fibre. We weighed some animals last week, and for 40 days they put on a fraction over two kilos. That would be, um, that's the best we've ever done. So last year we had a particularly challenging winter, and uh, there was a lot of mud around, and we only had, we averaged 900 grams for the whole winter. This winter we've been on top of the ground, and the results have been um, quite spectacular. So um, how much marbling is too much marbling? Well, we've been, historically we've used bulls with an EBV of uh, two and a half to three and a half. Last year we had three animals disqualified from the BPQ program because they were marble score eight, which is sort of, um, that's getting up to waggy type stuff. And um, they didn't actually have a, when you have a look at those uh, BPQ results, there's there's nothing at the top end that says um, you can't have too much mass in it, but I guess um, they've got to draw the line somewhere. So I'm thinking that now that we're using bulls that are three and a half to six, there's going to be a lot more animals fall into this. And I remember I've been speaking at sort of industry events for um, quite a few years now, and Originally, when I started talking about marbling, and everyone thought I had three heads, you know, they looked at me as if I had three heads and thinking, why the hell would you want to put marbling into your herd if you're not going to get rewarded for it? So I advocated that it's going to happen one day, and it has happened, and it'll get to the stage where, when they've got enough animals that are eight and above, that they'll get another market for that, which will, I expect will be. Um, quite a bit more um, profitable. So we obviously the, the, the more marbling that the, the fodder beat enhances the marbling so but we had a heifer last year that we put in the stake of origin competition she marble scored seven at 17 months off grass.
Angus Pure Index, as I mentioned before, it's got a, um, a real strong focus of ours because it's got a, a heavy weighting on um, on four and six hundred day. It's weighted heavily again for um, early maturity, so there's no point having animals that don't lay down fat and mature early because you won't get them finished before they're um, before they're sort of 22 months old. Marbling, obviously, we've discussed, and the low mature cow weight. It's not all about genetics. That, um, a lot of it we found over the last three years is about how we manage our cattle. And um, last year, I was scanning all the cattle on the truck, and I found that the cattle that went on the bottom deck were a lot more of them falling into the master grade and the cattle that were going on the top deck and the reason for that was you've got to shove a prodder up their ass to get them up to the top deck and that was upsetting them so we built a double decker ramp this year and it's just completely taken all that stress away so I can load I loaded 45 steers the other day in 18 minutes just myself and the driver and there was nothing there when the BPQ sheet came back they all went through and also uh, there was no problem at all with um, with meat color or pH so it cost me about four thousand dollars for the timber and about four thousand dollars to build it which is about three steers so one of the things we found is once we've got them in their groups that we don't box them up again because obviously we all know what happens when you box bulls up um, they beat the pass out of each other but we found that it's the same thing with steers although and heifers you, you don't see them fighting but if they if you disturb that group within about 30 or 40 days of tracking them you're going to have problems with meat color and pH so we walk them to the yards the night before and feed them bales we don't use hunterways on them we just use quiet heading dogs we don't hit them at all in the yards we don't use sticks and um, obviously the loading ramps made a big difference Just a few facts on um, on the BPQ hit rates and the, the effect of fodder beat. So earlier on this season we had 66% hit rate at 17 months, that's off grass. Then 86% um, hit rate after 50 days on fodder beat and then 93% after 80 days. Um, Carcass weight empty is about 54 to 56. And then when the weighed light at the plant, it's somewhere between 58 and 60%. So the key message is, um, are there aren't any substitute for fertility because you haven't got a live calf on the ground to start with, you can have as much marbling and growth, um, it's, you're not gonna be able to uh, make any money. So fertility is number one. On a scale of one to 10, fertility is 10 and carcass traits three. So gives you an idea of how important fertility is. We scan all our replacement heifers, so we, um, all our commercial heifers, we scan them for IMF and, and DMA. It costs us about seven bucks, and we use that as a culling tool, and that's why we have that one, one spread heifer policy, because we don't scan the animals until after they've been run with a bull, so we don't get to select our replacements until they've been scanned. So we take a calf out of them and then sell it. We, we kill them after that. So we're just tightening our bell curve up all the time and taking about 15% of our poorer marbling heifers out every year. And we've done all our cows as well. So it's, um, we've got a herd now that's um, it's pretty tight on that, um, on that bell curve. Genetics, obviously very important. Nutrition. Um, I mean, whether they're on red clover or whether they're on fodder beet or whether they're on what we call our rocket fuel mix, which is a red clover, white clover, plantain, Italian mix. The important thing is those animals are growing every day of their life. You, when Bill Austin comes and scans our animals, he can see if they've had a feed check. There's a line through the middle of them. You back that up, Wayne. So the important thing is for them to grow every day of their lives. Management too, obviously pretty important the way we handle them. So temperament, part of it's genetic and part of it's management. 
Um, just something else that we've been involved with over the last three years at Mount Linton, um, funded by Beacon Lab, um, run by Ag Research. Um, a beef cow efficiency trial. So we're weighing our cows three times a year and body condition scoring them as well. We weigh them uh, coming out of the winter, pre-cowing, body condition score at the same time. Then we do the same thing uh, pre-mating, which is in December at calf marking. Um, then again at weaning. So one of the things we're trying to find is um, we're trying to find a relationship between body condition score and weight and that animal's ability to put weight back on in a, in, a, in a short period of time because a mature cow weight EBV can be very deceptive. You can have an animal that's body condition score five and a half or six and weigh 550 kilos, which is obviously really undesirable. You want a cow that's 550 kilos and a body condition score of seven. So the body, so the mature cow weight matrix on its own can be very deceptive. So what we're trying to do is, as I said, we're trying to link a body condition score and a weight and try and develop that into an EBV. And it is, can be very confusing at the moment. So uh, some of the results we have over the first three years, this is last um, last autumn's weaning at 150 days. We had a um, uh, we had a range of calf weaning weight per cow body can body score. So the best of our cows, uh, she reared a calf that was 64 percent of her body weight. She was a 560 kilo cow and she reared a 358 kilo calf. The worst one, obviously you don't want cows like this in your herd, she's 680 kilos and she reared a 217 kilo calf. So I mean the, the difference in efficiency between that cow and that cow is just uh, chalk and cheese. 560 kilo cows a body condition score seven, which is ideal. Um, 680 kilo cows, five and a half. She didn't get back in calf anyway, so. It's, um, you, you just don't want those animals there. So given a 36 kilo uh, birth weight, which would be about our average, that more efficient cow did 2.14 kilos a day. Sorry, the calf did. Um, the less efficient cow did uh, 1.2. That's us. Thanks, Gary. It's, uh, a couple of things come to mind listening to that. One, I hear that um, if you don't measure it, you can't do anything about it. So it's fantastic to see someone doing a lot of measuring. And I'm sure some, we must have some questions for Kerry on that. If anyone's got any questions? Did you put your cards on the bottom of it? What was your one record? Um, what we do is we. Did everyone hear the question? Um, the question was, do we winter our calves on fodder beef and what would their live weight gains? We, what we do is we have a, we've got about 1,400 um, two-year-old cattle, or about 1,000 by the time we've killed going into winter. So as soon as they've been killed, gone to the works, then we bring the calves down off the hill country and, and uh, we start transitioning them out about this time of year. Last year they did 600 grams a day, which was pretty disappointing because obviously the cost of putting the fodder bean in at about 2,600 a hectare against the spray of prey on the hill country that we're doing 600 grams a day on the turnips that we've thrown over an aeroplane. So, but you didn't start until now. So correct. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure whether the length of time on the fodder beat would um, affect the live weight gains. I think um, the reason they only did 600 last winter was mainly because of the weather. But we'd like to think we could do better than that this year. But I don't think I haven't heard of many people getting over a kilo on calves. I think Brent Fish is doing maybe slightly more than that. He might be doing about 1.1 they'd be right on top of the ground all, all winter. Any more questions? Oh, can I 
like to ask you one, with the, you talked about the, um, the grading of the IMF, is that on the same scale as the um, EV wings grind? Um, the question was um, the scale of the marbling on the uh, BPQ program is it the same as the EBB for IMF? So that that the um, the B sorry the uh, the um, uh, Silver Fern Farms BPQ program is on a scale of one to nine, and it's based on the um, OSME MSA score. And the marbling EBV is a percentage of um, of uh, marbling in the fat, so it doesn't. It's not correlated to that. Not on the same grade. No. Yeah. So that it goes from one to or zero to eight, eight point two, eight point three. So that the, yeah, the marble marbling score is different. Growth rate in your replacement stock from the uh, birth to the 600 day, your heifers to steers? The, heifer, the heifers, particularly, Matt? Yeah, well, just you're saying every day from their growing day, uh, the heifers doing 0.8, the steers doing 0.9. What's the <coughs> target then? Oh, well, we prioritise the steers. We've got a bit of a toughen up princess policy with the heifers, so they're the second class citizens. But we still like to have them growing every day. But they'd be, typically they'd be about 240 kilos at weaning. They'll do about 0.6 or 0.7 over the winter. And then when they come off the hill in the middle of September, we want them to do a kilo and a half up until about Christmas. And then they'll usually fatten off to about a kilo from then until, until the autumn. So they'll typically, our heifers would be about 340 kilos going to the bull. Um, they'd be about 450 at the end of the autumn going into the winter and about the same coming out of the winter. So effectively, with the calf and the fetal fluid inside it, that animal's probably lost 50 kilos over the winter, which we think is acceptable. But as I said before, some of our cows will lose 150 kilos over the winter. But we try and look after the, yeah, the first calves a bit better. Look, um, I think we'd better leave it there actually. I see the other room's finished and they're all waiting to come, come in. So I'd just like to thank Kerry very much. I um, saw, or we heard this morning, um, Graham Harrison talking about the future being in beef and his graph was going way up. And we know our beef exports now um, outweigh our sheep exports. So um, I think it's really good to hear good positive stories about beef. Thanks, Kerry. Thank